Hello and welcome to another Perusia podcast. I'm Shabu Reis, your host, and very excited about our guest today. He's the founder of the Fulton Sheen Movement, also known as the Fulton Sheen Institute as well. He's a professor and is none other than Dr. Peter Howard, joining me from the United States. Hello, Dr. Peter. How are you doing? Good eye. Good to meet you. Good to see you again. Not to meet you. I know you, but it's great to be with you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, it's been great. We did meet once. It was back uh, in July last year uh, at the uh, Catholic uh, Marketing Network, and it was wonderful to see you. But we have um, been in touch before that, but it was great to see you in, in person back then. Likewise. Nothing beats a live event. Um, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, it, you are uh, you are a, a busy man with uh, with the whole Fulton Sheen Institute. Um but I want to, before diving into, I mean, maybe a little bit about what that's about, but I'd like to get to know more about your faith journey. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite interesting and for people to realize um, what God has done in your life and how what got you here. Um, you're married, you've got children, um, and, you, and you're a professor. But why start the Institute? Why, why this? Why now? And uh, how do we get here? So where do we begin? Can we start oh. very quickly, maybe, what the Institute is and then... Let's go back and journey. <laughs> okay, sure. Well, we could do like a movie. I can mention it real quickly, and then we can do like all the the flashbacks of time. Uh, it really the, the Fulton yes. Sheen Institute uh, started in 2019, right before COVID hit, and then it, it got disrupted like everything else right after that. Um, and it really represented the fruition of 20 years or so of knowing or coming into contact with um, a man, Venerable Fulton Sheen back in 1998 that uh, really put my my life on the trajectory that I, I know God has always meant it to be on. And it's like everything that led up to that point was, I, I think, a preparation for it. And then everything that has flowed from it has been a fruit of it. And I just, I, I never found an individual and in a modern day saint, you know, his cause is underway, who really uh, spoke to me and had an impact on me just by taking a, a retreat in a car with him. <laughs> I made a personal retreat wow. and I, my sister gave me these, these cassette tapes of, I don't know if a younger audience will know what that is. Um, but I remember those. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I just, I was discerning um, just my direction in life. I was already looking into religious communities and priests and I'm like, it's kind of like the military. I think you should, everybody should almost give it a shot and, and have the experience and allow God to, use the experience in any way he wants. And so anyway, I, I took this retreat and my sister uh, handed me these, uh, these tapes and said, this retreat changed our pastor's life. And he was very young and he had just died. He died of cancer. And she said, but mm -hmm. uh, he was at this retreat in Dallas in 1972. And I, I think it's worth giving it a shot. And I was like, okay, well, I'll give him like 15 minutes because it's like a three and a half hour drive. I put him in and, and then um, within the first five minutes, I was completely hooked. It was a remastered digital uh, version of this retreat. So it sounded very, very clear. Like he was in the car with me. And, you know, I had studied uh -huh. under like you know, the best theologians out there. I went to, my undergraduate was just a few years before at the Franciscan University in Steubenville. So I was always surrounded by great uh, theologians. Um, and, uh, this was something very different. Like I put him in and I just like this, this man speaking to me as if he's like, knows my heart. It's as if God's voice was literally coming through him. And I knew I, I also have to make a, a, a big decision about my life um, and put something into practice. So anyway, that retreat changed my life. It refortified for me practices that I had done, but not as often like taking a daily holy hour before I learned the blessed sacrament um, he, of course, he educated me in a lot of things that I wasn't formed well mm -hmm. in. Um, and every chance I had, I went to Rome and studied in Rome after that for my, uh, advanced theological degrees. And when I had a chance to write on something like a thesis, I, I did two things. One, I always wrote on Mary. Our blessed mother was very important in my overall conversion way before I got introduced to Sheen. Um, I'll go back to that in just a second. But, uh, and then the other thing was, yeah. was Fulton Sheen. I found that he had a wisdom and a clarity um, uh, and a way of communicating very complex truths 
in a very simple language that anyone could understand. Mm -hmm. And for me, mm -hmm. one, it resonated with me. Two, it was very humbling. Like I, I, I felt exactly what he said. He says, yeah, you know, professors exist just to make truth sound complicated, you know, to justify, <laughs> to justify their positions. Uh, Cause he was always of the mentality of you, you, you need to be able to communicate truth to basically a, like an eighth grade level, you know, somebody who's like yes. 12 years old. Yes. And anyway, um, so, you know, those are the two things, our blessed mother, Venerable Fulton Sheen. And um, they have been my mission really for my entire adult life was to make our blessed mother known because I was also influenced heavily in my younger years before I came across um, Fulton Sheen. St. Maximilian Maria Colby was huge for me. St. Louis and Marie de Montfort, um, if probably reverse of me. First yeah. de Montfort, then St. Maximilian Colby, um, and then St. John Paul the Great has had a, a big impact on me. Yeah. They're all very similar in the way that um, of their formations and what their missions in life were. It was really like St. Maximilian conquered the entire world for our Blessed Mother in order to yeah. more perfectly and more quickly bring about the, the reign of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And so... Colby was like my man. He was my general. And then I met Sheen and I'm like, now I got two generals. And, um, yeah. and Sheen took me in other directions because I had more access to him. 60 plus books. Um, he just wrote and commented on everything as his televised series that most people know about life is worth living for the 1950s. Yeah. They still play him on EWTN still reaching people. So these things had a that won awards, right? That, that actually won awards. Right. He, Exactly. Um, it was yeah, a, did it not yeah, he, he won an Emmy award, um, which is uh, a bit right. for acting <laughs> and uh, for best personality yeah. on TV. And he built, he beat all <laughs> the big names and, and he had 30 million wow. people watching him every week. Um, and, and wow. most of his audience was non-Catholic, you know, 60% were non-Catholic. So he, he just became for me the, the, uh, the like the example par excellence of what we need for the evangelization, especially of the West and of the United States. And, and being from the United mm -hmm. States, um, you know, he, he would be like our saint in a certain way, uh, even though he's known all around the world and he is everybody's saint. But we need him here in in the states more than ever for the church, for the hierarchy, for our, our you know our bishops, our priests. Like he, Sheen is the answer to all of the crises that we face. So it became my life and it materialized over time in the Fulton Sheen Institute. Um, and then now we have a big movement that is uh, answering the question that everybody um, wants answered and resolved. Why isn't he beatified? And so we started a mm -hmm. petition uh, just not too long ago, and it's already gone around the world and gathering signatures to allow people to know what the truth is. Like, you know, where is it at? Where is this cause at? What is his, why is his um, cause and beatification so important? What is the impact that it's going to give to Catholics and non-Catholics all around the world? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then we can show the church, you know, the, the bishops in Rome, um, what the Vox Populi, you know, the voice of the people, um, the men's ecclesia, the, the mind of the church among the laity, especially that we want the saint and why we want him because the devil doesn't. So, this is a big part of how the, all these things kind of culminated um, in, at this very moment. Because you said, "Well, why now?" and and I've always asked that question. I, I've been I thought I've been ready for fifteen years, but like Sheen says, God doesn't do anything in history without the greatest finesse of detail. Why Mary appears at wow. a certain place at a certain time in history, nineteen seventeen, to Fatima, Portugal. You know, and it's a good way. It's an important practice for our own lives when we look through like our own conversion experiences. You know, you're asking me like, how, what was my, my story? Why did God, you know, when I was younger, why did he allow my father to go undergo a car accident that paralyzed him, changed my family dramatically when we were young, but it was also, you look back the, the good that God brought out of that evil um, was the, it was the, the, the invasion, you can say the, the divine invasion mm -hmm that began the conversion yeah. in my own heart. My mother turned us to Mary right away. We started praying the rosary. We never prayed the rosary before that. And we literally experienced miracles with my dad's 
uh, his his life and his condition mm-hmm. is even though it's always remained serious, but and that just kind of progressed throughout you know those the last gosh thirty years thirty plus years so thirty years okay so this is interesting um it's it's it's, it's tragic um, what happened but um, as you say God is doing something here uh, in your own life and your family. So Fulton Sheen, just on the Fulton Sheen uh, Institute, there is a website for that. And then what, what is that website? Sure, it's FultonSheen.Institute. If you can't remember that, we also have FultonSheenInstitute.com. So just remember the name.com. Okay, excellent. So, and and for yes. the, we do have a Very separate good. page for the movement because we're really focusing on the petition drive. Um, and you can go to FultonSheenMovement.com. And it's basically very simple okay. you'll see the petition it takes literally 15 seconds to sign it um and some really good news and now that it's it's happened i can actually say it uh just yesterday morning we have um dr scott hahn he he signed it himself and we have other catholic leaders right. stepping up because they know how important um the the influence and the teaching of wisdom of fulton sheen is for our own times so if that's encouragement for people yeah. i love to see australia and your whole oceania region I love to yes. see them take the charge because, like I said, Sheen's for everybody, and I'm kind of curious to see which part of the world clamors for him more. And as time goes on, I can get those yeah. statistics. Yeah, fantastic. We'll pray for that. We'll have the links in the description below as Excuse well. Um, let's go back then. Uh, so, so how old were you then um, when this happened? So, you just life upbringing. What what was it like? Are you a cradle Catholic? What was it like very early on? In- yes, I, I was a cradle Catholic. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, so the east coast of the United okay. States. And um, my my dad was uh, Irish Catholic. So a lot of people know what that means. Usually it's yeah. like you're a Catholic by name, <laughs> but and you make sure that your family goes to church. But there was really no death. There was no teaching or anything like that. My mother, she's from Puerto Rico. So, you know, Puerto Rican and Irish. And, um, and she, she was really the heart of the faith, um, in carrying it in our family, always making sure to the extent that she understood and to the extent that she could made sure that we were always in, in a good environment. If we could go to Catholic school, she sent it to Catholic school. They made lots of sacrifices for that. Um, but not very deep. And, um, you know, when, the, when my father's accident happened, it just turned the whole world upside down. And, you know, I, I do think of something that Fulton Sheen says, I mean, of course I didn't know it then, but he says, sometimes God's way, God's only way into someone's heart is to break it. Wow. And that we all felt broken because in a moment like that, you can, you either go, I hate God. I hate mm-hmm. you for doing this. How, and what did I do? You know, what did I do? Um, or it's, you get on your knees and you pray and you pray to make it through it. You also pray, like for the, this case, we just prayed for my father to, to somehow survive this because the first miracle is that he did survive it. The doctors said, just, they don't know how he did. They said, come on in to the to the, the trauma room and say your goodbyes. This was the first night. It, I mean, we couldn't even recognize him. It was that bad of an auto accident. Wow. Um, and yeah, he's, he stayed on. And I, went, I remember going into the chapel where my mother was and cause she was there, she went early with the police officers, you know, and from the moment the police officers came to our door, this is like two days before Christmas. And like we had just, this was our last day of school, you know, for Christmas break. And this happened, um, which is why my dad, I guess was in the accident because he, he went to the, he never should have been on this road. It was he went there cause to do Christmas shopping for my mom. So he normally would not be on this road and he was anyway, but, um, my mom was in the chapel and she was on her knees and she just kept praying and praying. And she told us from when the cops came to the door, pray the rosary, pray the rosary. We didn't ask anything. We just simply did what she said. And that began the rosary being introduced into our family and the rosary in in my personal belief, uh, led to real miracles with my father because the, his number one, he did survive when they said there's no way he should have been able to sustain that through the night. Secondly, his spinal cord from the impact of the accident was so hard it got severed. 
And um, so he was supposed to be paralyzed from the neck down. And, but over time, over the next couple of months, he started moving his hands when we would, when we would go and pray with him and talk to him and he'd squeeze our hand and the doctors would say, it's impossible. His spine is severed. He, you know, it's at this level, you can't move beneath them. Mm. And we're like, okay. Um, but we're like, no, this is not some kind of like spasm. That's what they were trying to say. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, it was, a, you know, he was able to do it. He had access of his arms, even though his shoulder blades were shattered from the impact. They had, they fused back in a way that always gave him pain. He was kind of like a tabernacle in our home for like 20 years of just our Lord suffering. Um, and the graces that God brought to our family and my mom, especially she, everything was of the faith. She did, she was, she especially I was the youngest. I, I am the youngest of the four kids. Yes. And I was visiting every day. My dad in Philadelphia at the special uh, rehab place for his body, always praying the rosary, going to prayer groups. My mom had prayer groups in her home, a little bit overwhelming for me at the time, but um, the environment was so prayerful that it, it just overtook me. You can say, um, doesn't mean I became a saint then I'm not a saint now, but those graces really had an impact because, uh, you know, was, my conversion was still ongoing after that. <laughs> wow. Wow. Absolutely. So did you say, so how long so did your dad, he, he lived on for how long after that? He, well, the accident was in 88 and he passed away in 2012. Wow. So about mm. almost about 20 years. No, wait, 20, 20, 20 88 to 12, almost 24 years. Yeah, praise God. So, Something I mean, like think that. about that. I mean, so, and that was, he shouldn't have, he shouldn't have lasted that long. The doctor no. said, usually somebody in that condition maybe lasts, if you're lucky, 10 years, maybe 11 or 12. Wow. Um, yeah. Because of what happens to your body when it's paralyzed. So, yeah. he, he lasted uh, quite a long time and he became a man of prayer. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, like I said, he was like a tabernacle in our home of just our, of our Lord, just present and suffering. Everything he did was he just offered up for, for all of us kids. You know, he, he, he lived his life vicariously through each one of us. And, you know, looking back, it's, uh, you know, so grateful that that was what my dad was able to give because the outside of that, I didn't get the kind of upbringing I would want to have from, you know, with my dad. Yeah. having a catch, going out to do things like th those days were done. Like he could mm. do some things, but he was more like kind of there, you know, yeah. he wasn't able to do much and he was a quiet person. So, you know, if we got to go to a baseball game. That was fun, but that's kind of the extent of it. There was no physical activity. Yeah. Yeah. It's understandable. So what was it? So then in your uh, teenage years and then, and then uh, young adult years, were you, um, you did this help? With your faith, you just got stronger as you grew up, or was there a time? How, how was your faith as you were growing up? My faith always grew. It got stronger. My my adolescent years were challenging because it was the I I I loved what was going on inside, and yet I was fearful of the perception of it in mm. at least the atmosphere in which I grew up. Um, you know, holiness was not something that was ever boasted about or, you know, or sought after or anything like that. Not like I'd boast about my holiness, <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, is like, you're just, you're overly self-conscious and there's, yeah. there you have your vanity and you don't want to be criticized. And, and also how would any of my friends understand this? You know, I, I eventually, I, I took a pilgrimage um, uh, the next, a year after my dad's accident and, or a year and a half after my dad's accident. And we traveled to many people probably have heard the place Medjugorje out in yes. Bosnia at that time, Yugoslavia. And like, we had never really traveled very far at all as a family. We, we, lived in New Jersey, we kind of went to this little region, you know, be, I don't know what the equivalent would be. Like if you lived in Sydney and you went to like Hawthorne or something else, like, I don't know, <laughs> but you, you didn't go very far within like a three or four hour, hour radius. We never went to Disney world, all these places that you know, my friends would go to. 
And I'm telling my friends like, yeah, what are you doing this summer? And they're like, oh, I'm doing this. And what are you doing, Pete? And I'm like, well, um, we're going to go on this trip to Yugoslavia. And they're like, what? I couldn't explain it. And I was, I felt kind of embarrassed. And looking back, I was like, gosh, I, I'm ashamed that I felt embarrassed because it was like something of my faith. And I saw that expression of faith as weakness um, rather than strength. And, um, but my friends, I, luckily I had good friends, you know, they were the smarter ones. <laughs> they weren't as into like the whole peer pressure thing as much you know, as anybody else. Um, but I didn't always notice that when I began to share little things, they always had a peaked interest in it. And so, you know, those years were interesting. Um, you know, by the time I was a senior in high school, I started a, a little prayer group, um, at my Catholic school probably the only Catholic students to ever like visit the chapel, oh. um, kind of the irony of the cat, well, of the Catholic school. Um, but we did it after school um, while people were leaving. It was about 15, 20 minutes of, you know, busyness. You can't get out of the parking lot. So we, I was like, this is a great time just to hang around and do a prayer group. So they started announcing it on the, on the PA system. I was like, Oh gosh, like they're going to people like, you know, who's leading this. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, we we met, we prayed a rosary and we prayed a chapel of divine mercy and uh, then we were done. Um, but we had a few people join. One of my uh, teachers joined us. And um, anyway, it's just kind of things that carried. Same temptations that, as everyone has during those years are with me. And the, the pools, yeah, the moral temptations are always there. Um, and... It, it it took well i mean they never really go away mm. um but it's uh it was always a test of my faith and i look back and i have to say i'm i'm convinced our blessed mother really did keep a grip on me because there were a lot of times where i just really wanted to just cross those lines like mm -hmm. the near occasions were right there over and over and over and uh you know and I had a lot of things going well for me um, that just made it even worse in that, some, in that sense of temptation. But I kept on the path and, and it was like, where am I going to go? Am I going to go? Like I wanted to do the military path. And then I was like, but then I started really having a good, stronger conversion. I was like, well, I started being attracted to the priesthood and I didn't see anything in between. It was mm -hmm. like that or that. Yeah. And so I just spent a lot of years and discerning the priesthood and, um, we're in your twenties anyway, now. This is right up to you now. Well, yeah, it started. It started in co my college years. So, okay. um, you know, I, I I was in America. We have a, what we call military service academies, like West Point, Annapolis, okay. Air Force Academy, and they're like the like the elite kind of academies that are trained for our armed services, for the officers and things like that. It's very hard to get in. And so, but I, I went, I went that path. I really wanted to go to the Naval Academy and you have to get nominated by a congressman or Senator. It was a big, big deal. And mm -hmm. so I went through the process and I got all of that. And then, um, but I had some health issues that were lingering that I knew could be a problem and it ended up becoming somewhat of an impediment at the same time, I began to realize the Lord's calling me to something else. Mm. And yet it was kind of heartbreaking. But the, the Lord showed me I could do it. I achieved all the academic standards, physical standards, and everything that you would need. I got the nomination. But it was like, so the Lord's like, I honored that, but here's what I really want you for. And I thought it was then going to be the route of priesthood. So I'm like, I'm all in. So I started making, you know, went to college. I switched my major uh, I went the theology route. I was like, people are like, what are you going to do with that? In my mind, I didn't care. I was like, well, I'll probably, you know, be a priest with it. That's where I kind of feel called right now. Yeah. And then, but as time went on, I'm like, well, I don't know if he really is or not, but I'm going to give it a shot. And so after my, my college years, a few years after that, I spent all that time until I was about 24, 25. Okay maybe 24. Anyway, just discerning the priesthood and giving God that time. It brought me to Italy. It brought me to Colorado, different parts of the state. Quite an adventure. That's, that's when the real adventure began, just discerning mm -hmm. God's will and willing to take the risks. A lot of yeah. people want to have it very comfortable and in the box and has to feed this route. I never really thought that, I, that there wasn't going to be some path of the priesthood for me until like one day it just changed. 
and like uh, doors would close. This I go to a community. The community ends up like folding after a year. <laughs> These oh. new communities. And then I was like, but I didn't quite feel called to that diocese of life. But I'm like, I love my faith. I love theology. I love teaching. I love speaking. This is what I want to do. And I guess I kind of felt afraid. Like, is there really a path for that outside of the priesthood? Then I began to realize I was forcing myself into a box, that that was the only side of the equation sign. Mm -hmm. Also, I had the very false misunderstanding of, I want the greatest possible holiness, you know, like, in an in a authentic way. I mean, we should all want that. Yeah. And, and as like, and my mind was like, well, it doesn't get any higher than the priesthood. Well, that's not, you know, there's a difference in the calling, mm -hmm. but the, the, uh, the level of sanctity that a soul is destined for, you can say are made for like St. Therese would talk about little cups, different size cups, as long as it's full, they can be in any place. And then I began to think about our blessed mother. Well, she wasn't a priest and she's the holy, she's the queen of saints. So mm -hmm. I had a lot of maturing to do, but God used all of those experiences. And then I just, I just took risk after risk. And then I started working for the church right after that. I got married uh, at this, right at the same time, um, mid twenties and yeah, wow. start a family. I mean, it's like, I never would have thought, I never thought I'd be sitting here in Northern Idaho doing a podcast with a friend in New Zealand. I mean, in mm. Australia, yeah, New Zealand, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to be, people are like turning off their, their, no, their podcast right now. <laughs> now we oh, New, New Zealand, Australia, the same thing, right? <laughs> uh, uh, outsiders might think that, but not, uh, yeah, it's, it's across the ditch as we call it. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Now, how many, how many children did you, um, do you have? Yeah. We have uh, six children. Wow. And we have one God. grandchild already. And a grandchild. Wow. Wow. A granddaughter, yeah. And what did you do? Um, really old. How did you start then? For, were you working in the church still, like the Borden family, or were you doing other things mm -hmm. or straight into the institute? Well, uh, it happened later um, okay. when we moved out to where we are now. Um, you know, I, I got, when I finished my degrees in Rome, uh, this was like 2003, I got married in 2002. Um, then right after that, I worked a couple of years for a bishop in Colorado. And then after a couple of years of that, um, I went for my doctorate in Rome, but I, I was able to do a, most of it stateside from, the, from America. Mm -hmm. And I'd fly over over a couple of years, but it, I did it in you know a few, just a few years, oh, which wow. was great. Yeah, I always recommend it to people. It's like if you're going to do it, if you're ever going to do a doctorate, like do it now. Like make whatever, cut out everything you can. Otherwise, it'll take you 10, 15 years. Anyway, mm -hmm. I did that, and at the same exact time, the Lord opened up a possibility or a, a position, um, becoming a, an adult faith formation director at a parish in Aspen, Colorado where I didn't think I'd be there more than just a few years, but I ended up being there for about not, I guess it was nine years. Wow. wow. And it was during that time as a position that had um, certain requirements and responsibilities that the pastors wanted. And outside of that though, I began to just expand uh, even before then, even, even when I was working for the Bishop, I was in Colorado Springs and the air force Academy was in Colorado Springs. And I was like, I, got to go and speak to these cadets. So I actually had a friend who was in charge of the Catholic program. And so he arranged so I could come in and speak to them. And so I got out and did his uh, speaking engagements. And then uh, no matter where I was, even in Aspen, I would f find opportunities to, to slowly grow that. I made a little makeshift studio in a basement of where I was. And I started doing filming. Um, right. You know, this was like 2011. And, uh, I, I love the power of media, you know, little mm -hmm. short films. And, um, so, uh, anyway, it was just a, using a, a, a position with flexibility to begin to grow. And then we, I left in 2016, but that was the first time we left everything and just did our own thing. My wife and I prayed about it. And then um, we said, we, we want to focus on families. And so we sold half of our stuff put the other half in storage, uh, bought a brand new 
as big as they come pull behind trailer. And we just started going around the country, giving talks at parishes, conferences, um, and anybody had opened their doors. Wow. And uh, yeah, From and that happened until <laughs> it was about a nine months to a year of doing that. And then we went wow. to Peoria, With the Illinois. Kids. The kids, the whole yeah, family the, just yeah. traveling around the country. Yeah, that, that sounds yep. amazing. Yeah, it was it was quite an experience. I mean, it was like being missionaries. There were mm. positive things with it. There were also real challenges. I mean, who knows what the schooling was like during that time? I guess in, in the homeschooling world, it's like you don't, you know, there's ultimate flexibility. Um, but that's actually one of the reasons that we did anchor ourselves after after about a year, because we wanted the kids needed stability yeah. and we also needed to figure out like, well, what, what's after this? You know, mm -hmm. so I felt like Abraham, like just go to a place that I'll show you. And I'm like, that's great. He didn't have six kids, did he? Nah. Um, anyway, so, but it was like, okay, it's a kind of a, it was a real test of faith. Like I teach about the faith. You got to empower faith. You got to, and we hear these things all the time. And I'm like, am I actually going to live it? Is, I mean, am I really going to do it? Am I going to take a step out of the water and at least get a step out onto the water and not sink. And uh, we did. And it's it's always been an adventure. Always been an adventure. To this very day, it's a, it's an adventure. Um, but we spent two years in Peoria. And I did, I, I that was a, a, a home base. I did speaking around the country. I did some, um, even in the Philippines. Um, yeah, wow. For the, 2000 for the 100th anniversary of Fatima, they had a big Congress, mm -hmm. blessed to go out to speak there, um, helped start a Catholic school, like a, Ch a Chesterton Academy. Um, and uh, just, I mean, as a professor and helping attract other people to it. Um, and then we, my wife's family moved to Idaho and they found that as a place that had everything that they were looking for. And we're like, okay, well, my wife, you know, they, her family always wanted to have everybody close together. So we just, I said, we'll try to make it work there. And <laughs> we've been here for the last almost five years. God, wow. So that's when I started the Institute. So five years. Why year. not? Yeah. <laughs> well, nine, 2019 is when I started it. It's when I actually found that it gave it, it gave it a body and then COVID came. So like I said, it was all the traveling ceased. I had to reinvent everything. Mm -hmm. I was like, for a while, I had to learn how to do roofing. I had to do anything. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not in a major place. This is not a Catholic section of the country. So in many respects, it was like, oh my gosh, Lord, what a place to just have to be when things just come crashing down. Um, but it's turned out it's been definitely a place that I think God wants us to be. And mm -hmm. uh, just building it up piece by piece. And, you know, like I said, it, we're like a kind of an entrepreneurial family. So we keep building on what we can so yeah. that we have freedom with our family. My wife, she, she also does work. Um, but she does a lot of like life coaching things that she enjoys doing. Okay. We, and, and so it's, even now things are, you know, in, in an evolution, but they're all maturing and you can say they're kind of reaching like the, like the moment that everything was made for. I do uh, believe it, it is for right now. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing. Wow. I'm, I'm curious how the people in the Philippines discovered you. So were you already known um, across the country with all this traveling and, 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 and giving talks? What sort of talks were you giving? Uh, how, when you, when you went into that, was, did you have a website or was it just word of mouth? How did people discover you then? Um, yes, yeah, good question. Um, I'm trying to think of what existed at the time. Well, we obviously had um, the chronology. In 2006, when we left Aspen and went on the road as a family, we formed our own company, you could call it. Okay. Um, and it was called Heroic, Heroic Families. And we oh, did wow. have a website. And, um, and so I began to do some uh, some writing, some blogging. Okay. And I also did some teaching as a professor for, uh, the Avila Institute. Maybe people have heard the Avila Institute yeah. for spiritual formation founded by Dan Burke. Yeah, um, nice. I was one of the very first professors to be a blessing, to be a part of that as a Mariologist is what I was teaching. And then I expanded into other courses. Uh, so I had a chance to you know do that, but all, it was really my writing 
that was getting out. And this one woman, um, and she, she lives in British Columbia, Canada. She's Filipino. And, um, she, somebody had canceled, <laughs> um, uh, for this Congress. Um, and she came across a writing of mine and I forget exactly what it was, but it was one of my favorite, along the, the lines of one of my favorite topics, as far as how do you understand the times in which we are in looking at our lady in history from the mm -hmm. time of our lady Guadalupe to the present and mm -hmm. really connecting all of the dots and talking then about Fatima. And she said that she came across that and she just, she knew that she found somebody of like mind. And so she reached out. I actually thought it was like a uh, spam or something like that. At first, I'm like, this is, where did this come from? It really yeah. came out of nowhere. And I responded. And then um, she, we, we just really connected. We talked over the phone for a while. And then I got invited and it was like a month away. And <laughs> which isn't that much time. Nah. And so I, I was like, yeah, I, I'll, I'll do it. And I, and I was going to be speaking in Ohio because they had, I was speaking at the, this place called the Apostle for Family Consecration, which I'll be doing this summer. Okay. All these families come in, these family conferences and they, and their kids are getting uh, fed all in, in the kid, children's track. The adults are meeting and getting their, you know, th I don't know how many yeah. thousands of people are there over the summer, but anyway, she, she invited me out. And so I did, and I ended up, she is from one of the best known Catholic families in all of the Philippines, wow. the D family. Her father okay. was the previous ambassador from the Philippines to the Holy See and met Sister Lucia Fatima. And she showed me a picture and then I met him. Wow. So the the apparitions in Akita, Japan, um, her father was critical in speaking with Cardinal Ratzinger about that and, and showing that it does have approval. Um, so I... I had no idea. Then I ran into an old classmate of mine, Father Michael Gately. Everybody knows who he yes, is now. Yes. He happened to be there. And we're like, just I hadn't seen him in years. And there he was. So anyway, this is amazing how God works when you just step out. You know, mm -hmm. I wish it was more announced and organized. I'm a very structured person, you know, a very obsessive compulsive. So it's like, so there's parts of this environment that's hard for me. <laughs> yeah the traffic in the philippines which will probably get you there <laughs> oh my gosh uh, yeah. <laughs> thank goodness i didn't have to drive yeah <laughs> well now um interesting this is fantastic because you, you are a professor you a mariologist you are or what other areas were you teaching in uh, outside of mariology well i taught um things on uh catholic spirituality mm -hmm. um uh, uh, like spiritual theology is one. I mean, that's an mm -hmm. actual de uh, department, you can say, or branch of theology is spiritual theology, yes. which um, which is very, I think, very important for people to realize. It, it ties into really what Christian anthropology is. So okay. um, it really puts everything in its proper place. There's different kinds of wisdoms, and we often oversimplify that um, courses on like spiritual specialized courses on the, uh, the the teaching and wisdom of St. John of Avila, yes. who I didn't really know much about before I taught the course, but it was an opportunity and I'm, I love learning and teaching is a great way to do that. Um, what I, had, I did, a well, I did, a, a, they had two levels, ongoing formation and master's levels. And so I started with master's levels and then I did a kind of a little bit of both different expectations, different, you know, assignments and laid back more with the, the ongoing formation. Um, and so, and, and less time. Um, but it was, uh, um, uh, biblical principle studies, um, looking at the lives of various saints, uh, mm -hmm. courses just on that, like the history of spirituality, you know, from like St. Athanasius until, uh, like the turn of the millennium. I'm trying to think of all these dates, but it was, it was interesting. It was a broad spectrum. Wow. And that's kind of, I mean, my background was like that though. I mean, I, I'm a Mariologist. I specialized in Mariology, but my, um, but my general specialization, you can say for my licentiate degree is um, dogmatic theology. So okay. it's a great foundation to have before you go into the other ones. Cause this always keeps you anchored because yeah. spiritual theology and things you, you can go off, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, okay. Interesting.
Well, we'd love to uh, um, we'll have a discussion about potentially a course from you one day on our Perusia Academy, but uh, we have to talk about that. And, but Avila Institute is a, is a fantastic institute. Dan Burke uh, is coming to Australia uh, early next year in 2024, uh, awesome. so we're preparing for that and um, uh, we'll be having sessions with him and please God, yeah, promote the Avila Institute in a big way. And I know there is... Um, there is a, a group of Australians around that are that are students of the Abel Institute, and they have been doing it for a few years. And so we're praying for that to develop and expand and, and and reach more people. So that's great work what you're doing. They are they're doing great work. Yeah, praise God. Let's talk about the Fulton Sheen Institute. What is that specifically? Okay. Um, so what does that do? Um, what what's its mission? Sure, the mission is to really to continue the mission of Fulton Sheen himself, mm -hmm. who was given to the church um, as an extraordinary intellect uh, with a very comprehensive understanding of the truth about God, the truth about uh, the world, and the truth about humanity. And at a time where we're just very disordered and um, confused, the, the Institute is not only just bringing his teaching uh, to the forefront to reintroduce to those who do not know him, but it is also to show that providentially the wisdom that we can gain, and it's very accessible with Fulton Sheen, will help give us the kind of formation that we need for the saints that we need in these very critical times. So nice. that's the essence of it. And then, you know, as the, as the founder of it and one who uh, does uh, the teaching, right now it uh it, it started out primarily with live events introducing okay. sheen to parishes going around um and uh and retreats and then when covid came that made like i said that made everything difficult and i was i had yeah. just launched it i mean literally three months before so i had some wow. momentum because i was doing sheen things already yeah. and then the beatification yeah. was actually scheduled for that uh, December of 2019. Wow. And that really would have been like the launching point um, yeah, for the yeah, whole institute right. because everybody had at that time was had re renewed interest. So anyway, um, I did a few online things, but then it was like, I'm just bringing, I was inserting Sheen into other people's events. Like there was a one for Christopher West and the theology of the body. And they wanted me to do something mm -hmm. on Fatima and Sheen. And so I just kept filling it in to keep it moving while I was also trying to figure out what's the best way for me to be able to start providing things yes. um, when, when the rugs pulled out from underneath. Um, during COVID, I, I put together a course. This took a, many, many months um, and you can get it uh, at fultonsheen.institute. And it's, it's called The Final Hour, Fulton Sheen's mm -hmm. Plan to Save America, Ellipsis, and the World. And it really is like, it was like the, the fruit of like 15 years of my own passion and research and study and wanting to put something down in front of Catholics. It's, it'd be like, kind of like a master's level course to a certain degree, because I go deep into certain things and it's like 30 hours of video courses. Wow. It's like four modules and it takes you through from the signs of our times and how Sheen understood them, what he said prophetically about them, what we, what heaven has had to say about the signs of our times, um, and what we're experiencing in the signs of our times, all within the context. I, I, I weave it um, well together with Fulton Sheen and what he's saying, his commentary. And then I take them into how do we understand what's going on in the world? That was the mm -hmm. essence of Fulton Sheen. He studied the world very simply. He's like, I, I want to know what the world's thinking, and I want to respond to all of its errors with St. Thomas Aquinas. Like nobody really knows that, but that's, that was his mentality because in a world that's unhinged from God and, and it was more and more believe whatever you want in relativism, he saw mm. all that coming. He says, we need the metaphysics of St. Thomas, the realism that there is a reality mm. to base things off of. There is right, there is wrong. No matter mm. if, if, if nobody's right or everybody's wrong, they exist. And he, and so he was determined to just through his TV shows as well, to re to introduce to the world, the answer to our crises is to re rediscover 
an, an authentic presentation of the of a uh, the, the fullness of the of the Christian philosophy of life. And so this course kind of guides them in a similar way of transporting it to our times. And then like the first half is very, a lot of history, a lot of history. I call it a red pill experience for many people. Like if you actually okay. go through it, like you will, for people who are awake, you can say they, they, they'll get it and they'll find some mm. comfort because I bring in the popes, I bring in the history and the tradition of the church and they're everything I'm talking about. I give all the sources. So that's why it's a great course. It's right there on the screen. And, um, and then I'm just commenting mm. on that. And then the second half is the solution. How do we that's deal good. with the crisis now? Like, and this is like four years ago or th three, uh, three years ago, two and a half years ago, something like that. It's what we've done in two and a half years is crazy. Compared to then, mm -hmm. now, the whole gender dysphoria, I talk about those things in there. Like, this is what's coming. This is what the end game of the enemy really is. And we have to understand that so that we understand why the solution that heaven is giving us and through the saints of our times and through the popes, this is why they say these things. And mm -hmm. then you can appreciate it. And then the message of Fatima is very important um, near the end as far as like, what is the, what is the how do we simplify this complex problem? We do. We look at Fatima. It's so simple that a ten-year-old, a nine-year-old, and a seven-year-old were entrusted with the answer mm -hmm. to all the problems. So I take them deeper, though, into what that actually translates into in the message of Fatima and how that applies ultimately to our own life. And I'm hoping by the end, it's been an intellectual and spiritual experience where um, the student is. Uh, really goes through a massive transformation so it's, yeah, it's still wow. on the site so it's on there available for purchase um it what? is it's on there yep, yep. it's it's available sure. for purchase and right. i think it's quite a deal considering how much i paid for all my degrees i was like gosh i would what i presented in this is like cost me probably a hundred times more yeah well wow. you know i mean like if i were to get it anywhere else maybe a thousand yeah. times more. I don't know, but it was ridiculous. But I was like, but these are the, it was, it's like the synthesis. This is what the Catholic today needs to understand no matter where you're coming mm -hmm. from. It's not a, it doesn't cater to one group or another. This is yeah. the truth yeah. of what's going on in the world. This is the truth of what the church has been, uh, that the church has seen. Um, this is what the church has prophesied and predicted. This is what Fulton Sheen then takes all mm -hmm. of that and presents it to us. And you're like, I mean, if you like connecting the dots in, in your faith and history, this one course does all of that. Wow. That's fantastic. So that's a big centerpiece of the Institute, this big course. It sounds wonderful. I want to do it myself. Um, but what, what, any plans of other courses within the Institute? Have you got other things in the pipeline? Um, yes, more, it'll be more, uh, toward the fall. I, I want to begin okay. launching, um, my first live course. Uh, through okay. the institute, um, and it'll be on our Blessed Mother and uh, okay. and Beautiful. Fulton Sheen, um, and uh, I think that's a it's a great foundation. And then there are other things that um, I'd like to be able to introduce. There's just different. There's different levels right now through the movement. We're building up also a community of those who love Sheen, and yes. within that community, then it's able to also find out what they're also seeking. I want to be able, mm -hmm. I'd like to offer things that I know others, that there's a growing interest uh, you know, to mm -hmm. learn more about mm -hmm. rather than saying, I think you have to know this and this is why I'm offering that. The Mary course is, that is actually how that one is. But I don't know mm -hmm. of any person who's not like, oh my gosh, that's where I want to start too. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other things that might, you know, I mean, he crosses into philosophy he does even some catholic psychology you can say you know, he drew from all all the sciences in order to come to the truth and yeah. how we can evangelize the person of today because a lot of the apologetics things which is fascinating is not what's really bringing about conversions as much as it was let's say 20 years ago yeah. you know it's less yeah. rational and intellectual today it's much more experiential and personal at the level that we need to reach people, which is what both Sheen said and St. John Paul II said. That's why he had the theology mm. of the body. Wow, look at that.
Now, you uh, are you still doing the – there was a daily rosary for a while. Is that still going? Uh, was that part of the institute or is that something your members or followers um, can participate in? Absolutely. I mean, the whole world can participate if they want. I love yeah. that. Um, yes, thanks for asking. Uh, weekdays, so Monday okay. through Friday. Well, yeah. Monday through Friday here, that would US, be um, – That's Tuesday yeah, till Yeah, it would be Monday Saturday. through Saturday. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. late yeah, Monday put, night. Tuesday morning. <laughs> yeah. Tuesday till Saturday. You know, it's, it's hard because the, of the time difference. It is. Um, but uh, it is, it's at 8 a.m. Pacific time. So I'm on the West Coast of the U.S. So I'm actually kind of closer okay. to you guys in some respect. But yes. which I think is like midnight. Yeah. The it's, next it's, day. It's, uh, it depends, winter or summer. So it would be late at night, if not 11 p.m. Yeah, um, something like that. Right. So. But, you know, it's, uh, it could be something maybe once, once a week you do. Um, yeah. But we have, uh, we have people who join us very faithfully. I mean, it's not like a, a random group each day. These are people who are very faithful since I started it uh, two summers ago. Okay. Um, and they're, uh, I mean, many are from Europe. Of course, we have um, many from around the United States, all, yeah. all the different regions. Canada is a lot, big representation from Canada. Um. Once in a while, we get someone from the Oceania region, okay. um, which, uh, well, one woman, he's, she's pretty faithful. If she doesn't watch us live, she she watches the replay and she she prays okay. it that way because we, we pray for everybody who will also watch it as a replay. We lift it accurately. Yeah. We intentionally lift them up um, and Our Lady can figure out because she's, you know, the mediatrix yeah. of all graces. She'll figure out how to disperse them. Um, but we have a friend in Tasmania. And so, wow, um, yeah, so, you know, it, it's something that, uh, you know, I still encourage people to, to think about, uh, and maybe just doing it once, a, once a day. Um, and I mean, hopefully if it continues to grow too, then I can find other opportunities to, you know, to do it. But, you know, we, we, we pray the Fulton Sheen rosary, which is important. The reason why is because, um, it has five decades like everything else, but each decade is a different color and he called yes. it the world mission rosary. And each decade represents a region of the world for evangelization for primarily for missionaries. And cause he was the head of the propagation of the faith for the missions in the United States and really ran most of it of the world. And so the first decade is the color is yellow and we pray for China. Or, I'm sorry, for Asia. I always, China always comes to mind. We, I, I particularly mentioned the conversion of China, North Korea, Asia. The second one is red for the blood of the martyrs of the Americas. So we pray yeah. for all the Americas. The third one is white for Europe. And um, because that's where the Pope is in white, so they get the white. And then it's uh, blue for guess what? Oceania. Uh -huh. Yes, and then and then green for Africa on the fifth decade. So we pray for the, all the regions of the world, and it's really beautiful and powerful. Especially when we get somebody from a rare region joining us because it's a big time difference, or it's just not as easy. Um, you know, sometimes we get somebody maybe from the Middle East or India. Um, you know, uh, it's 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 spreading, but it's. I, I think I need to give it a little bit more attention um, because every time I do, there's always a surge and then, it, you know, but the rosaries sometimes for people, okay. they, you know, unless it becomes a habit, it's, it's not something you might stick with though, but it's powerful. Yeah. We've actually had some people that have, they've declared some miracles have happened. So God knows about Praise that, God. that they were praying for this and this, and they said, look, this actually happened. This person was cured and the doctor doesn't know why. So it's like, so that's praise awesome. God. That's all I have to say. Amen. <laughs> all the time. Well, we'll have to, yeah, join sometime. I encourage everyone here if we can join around around the world. That's so, so important. Um, and, and people, and where is that live streamed? Uh, just on oh, your website? Yes, yes. No, we. it's on our YouTube channel. So okay. if you go to YouTube and simply put in the search Fulton Sheen Institute, or you put at mm -hmm. Fulton Sheen Institute, that okay. is our address instead of like, you know, 50 to a hundred alphanumeric letters. Mm -hmm. We, we went in and changed it. So it's just 
at Fulton Sheen Institute, all one word, and you'll see it. It's where our podcasts are. That's another big part of what we do with the Institute. We do podcasts until we start building mm-hmm. up the courses. We do a lot of podcasting. Um, yeah, we had just had Jason Everett on, uh, another guy, Jason mm-hmm. Jones, uh, kind of movie producer. Uh, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it's i love the, just like you're doing i think the podcasting format is a very powerful way to reach people um and it's called the catholic patriot and it's on the same channel so you can um you know it's it's easy to find you can see all our mm-hmm. episodes that are on there so between that and the online course and in the fall some you know actually some live courses it's we're we're putting it together you know and then of course the movement is really yeah, getting a lot of attention because we can't that is like let's one of our that. biggest thrusts. Yeah, let's talk about that now because we're come, running out of time. But I want to sure. just finish up here on this movement. Um, you did start. You talked about um, the beatification process. Now, is, now we're talking about is Fulton Sheen. He's a venerable now. What, what are the stages? Can we talk about what what they are to canonization? Just just a quick recap. What does the church teach here? And that that'll be sure. interesting. For us. Sure. Well, we'll put it in the context of uh, of Charbel right here. Charbel okay. dies, a massive theological term here, cult, that they call it the cult of the saints. It means the veneration, the worship, starts to build up around Charbel and how he was like this great founder of, of this Catholic media thing and just evangelize the world. Okay, the reputation gets out there and then somebody says, hey, let's ask Rome. We believe that there's more to him that as an example um, and he lived a life that, of heroic virtue that we want recognized. And it, it's mm. going to be for the good of the people of, let's say, of Australia. Yeah. And so they submit it uh, to a bishop and somewhere where they are, and usually where, where you grew up or where you died, and see if they'll take it on. And if they say, oh, wow, there's a lot of evidence here, they take that and then they submit that to rome saying here's a like a, a condensed version of an individual we would like to propose for you mm-hmm. to consider to eventually canonize a saint put you into the canon of the mass where they can say your name and locally and you have right. a special feast day and all that so if the church says yes to that then they say okay he's now a servant of god okay. and that means that the church is looking at him and there's enough to say that you know that he was a servant of God. Now, did he live a life of heroic virtue? That's ultimately why a saint is canonized is because they are yeah. somebody to emulate. And that phrase is very important, heroic virtue. So then they investigate every aspect of this individual's life. I mean, there's no more thorough investigation than somebody who's being proposed for to be considered a saint. Yes. And they investigate everything everybody that knew you growing up is that still alive and everything you've ever written every podcast you've made any public appearance anything that that you've done they they will find a way to get access to it and scrutinize it um and see one is there any theological error in it um what was his personal life like did he really you know live the gospel to a, a, a heroic degree um, and then this could be like 12 volumes by the time, I mean, for Sheen, right. it was something like that. And then you submit that when it's all said and done, they submit that to Rome in a condensed three volume version of it. Uh, okay. I think that's the, the new. And so Rome reads that. And if they find the evidence that's in there and, and they also will raise questions like, Hey, this needs to be looked at more. This, this, we have a question about this. Usually those things are all done in the process. Cause they don't want, by the time that the three volumes are handed in, they really want it to be like, we've already gone through everything. So, yeah. okay. uh, so Rome is active. The congregation for the causes of saints is a, what they call a dicastery. Just, they have different ones, major ones, um, for clergy, for the causes of saints, cause for the, for bishops, and so they they read through it. They say, "Wow, there really there's evidence of heroic virtue." This is the panel of theologians, and then they say, "This man's heroic," and so we will. He's earned the title venerable. He's now able to be venerated. That's okay. actually the big the big declaration when it comes to like of of the character of the person. To, to get to venerable means like this person lived an heroic life. Yeah. So yeah. after that. Then they say, well, is he, is this person in heaven? Is Charbel in heaven? So the, well, people have been praying to him and then um, they said, well, we need evidence. Evidence of that would be 
prayers directed in a clear way to Charbel in heaven, and it would be uh, for a miracle. And if it's granted, I mean, if, if, if a, an alleged miracle takes place, that miracle then gets submitted to the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. They have a theological review board and a medical review board. And they all scrutinize this thing. They interview yeah. one thing. They interview everybody who knows everything about it. And that they both come to the conclusion that this is, an, is a valid miracle. And it truly is connected to this individual or couple praying for this particular thing. And there's enough witnesses to, to verify that. Then they'll say, wow, this miracle did exist or did happen. And it was through the intercession of this individual in heaven. And so therefore... Um, we confirm that miracle, and therefore, the, he, the the venerable person is now able to be called blessed, because it now shares the blessed vision of God in heaven. You're among the blessed in heaven. Wow. After that, that's huge. Second, <laughs> it is, yeah, exactly. Just one miracle would be huge. One person, we've got thousands of saints. So to have, yeah, that scrutiny. <laughs> it's it's I mean, there, there's the nothing more meticulous in investigation in that. So anyway, and then after that, they another alleged miracle needs to be confirmed for that individual, and then they would canonize the person a saint. So that's the that's process. That's two miracles or three? Is that two, two. two. One, one to become two. blessed, and a, a second one to be canonized a saint. Okay, okay. So Wow. Yeah, yeah. so we're, um, and Fulton Chain now is that venerable. He does well. He, well, he is, but he's really basically blessed in that they, Pope Francis, they they confirmed a miracle of him back in 2019. And you look it up; it's uh, a decree was sent out by Pope Francis. I think it was July 5th of that year, and it confirmed a miracle of uh, it's like a re a resurrection account, really. I mean, a, a, a baby was born of a couple in Peoria, where Fulton Sheen's from, um, without a heartbeat or pulse for 61 minutes and as then they they fervently sought the intercession of Fulton Sheen and um after th that 61st minute the baby like woke up came alive or whatever you want to call it it was um because the baby was you know clinically would be considered dead for 61 minutes with no heartbeat um and, and baby came alive and um the doctors said it was, there was that's absolutely impossible for that to happen. Then it was even, I say more impossible, but equally impossible was to be without any vital signs, to be clinically dead for so long, and then not have extensive brain damage or any you know coming out of that. And but the baby was born healthy, normal, and alive today. I think he's twelve years old. James Fulton. They named him middle name Fulton after Fulton Sheen. And they approved that miracle. And so Pope Francis said, okay, set the date, uh, Peoria, and we'll, we'll and then we'll approve it for you. And they set that date just a few months later. And that once that declaration came out, it was just as soon as the diocese is able to do it. It's just logistics, you know, get the media, get everybody in, all that. And then it was set for that year. And then two weeks before it was supposed, the mass was supposed to take place because it's just a ceremonial mass. I mean, a lot of things go on in the ceremony, but it's it, within the context of that mass where they then announce him to the public and the faithful as he's now blessed Sheen. Um, it was canceled, or they said indefinitely postponed, and never, nobody knew why. It was this big mystery. And so, but it came out, the call came from the Bishop of Rochester, New York, where Sheen was bishop for three years in 66 to 69. And, um, he called Rome to ask Rome to postpone it because he said there was an investigation going on, a secular investigation of all the dioceses of New York. And, um, and Sheen was obviously a bishop during that time. It, they were looking into, was there any misconduct, mishandling by the bishops over, I don't know how many decades, you know, they've been doing this in dioceses around the United States, maybe in other countries, you know, they're always, they're looking at all these cases. And so anyway, so, that was still going on. And then some people said, oh, well, there were two questionable priests underneath him. Wow. And, you know, we're not really that. sure. This is where it gets, you know, into like a movie script because then it was Rome knew any potential allegation, 
not towards Sheen, but anything that went on, these questionable priests, you know, they looked and believe me, there's one area the church is going to look into yeah, is that. Okay. And so he was, they cleared him of everything, but then this call went in was saying, well, we want to make sure that there's nothing that could be brought up yeah. that could tarnish the celebration. And then there's a lot of things behind the scenes that had happened as well that influenced that call. So, but it's been iced this, the investigation uh, in New York has been concluded for some time now. And, and, but they're like forever in releasing the report. But when, when I called the diocese of Rochester, I said, well, would you know if there was anything that was questionable about Sheen? And I said, yes, it would, it would be brought to our attention. You know, that was two years ago. And so it's over. Yeah. And, and then recently, um, a re I know of, um, a, a reporter who contacted yeah. the archdiocese or the diocese of Rochester and they're like that. They're not interested right now in this. There's like, there was no, so it's, it's, it's okay. very odd. It's put a lot of suspicion into like even the whole question of the, of the, the procedure of the church. Yes, yes. It's caused unnecessary doubts that people might have in Fulton Sheen. Well, why is he, you know, why isn't he? And, and, and so part of the movement, a big part of this movement was really to do two things, was to remind people, one, Sheen's already been declared venerable, which means he's been proven to have heroic virtue. The church has investigated everything, including these things that we have already known about that people have talked mm -hmm. about, not New York. They haven't said anything. And three is also to be kind of a, an instrument yeah. of healing and, and, and helping people to realize, too, that uh, you know, Fulton Sheen is indeed um, – a, a man worth venerating and he is you know the devil yeah. does not want him because of okay. he what he represents for the for the reforms of the church that are needed um the reinvigoration of the church that's needed okay. um the, not just among bishops and priests but among the laity but all of us this is a huge huge deal and you know, let alone the moment he is declared blessed because it's going to happen. Um, what the world would be will be funneled into the Sheen universe. You can say they will rediscover him in a way that they never have before, and he has all the answers to the to the challenges that we have now. Mm. Um, and so that's what this you know the movement has been to help people to realize all of these things and the, and the true history and the truth of where it stands. All Rochester has to do is. Tell Rome there's nothing that's on Sheen. And uh, we're yeah. good. And they can set the date again and within a couple of months they could have the mass in Peoria, who's done so much of the I mean, they did mm -hmm. all the hard work and I'm so grateful for them. I mean, they they raised the money to, that went into all of this. So it's um, you know, they they have yeah. uh they've put themselves out there in every possible way. And then to kind of have the rug pulled out from underneath them is, is, I think, a great injustice to their work and the work of the Holy See. So I'm hoping that this is something that will be rectified really, really soon. Um, and that the growing voice of the mm -hmm. church through this movement, through those who signed a petition, you know, I, we were looking to have it in the hundreds of thousands, which is quite small, to be honest, um, to be the ones that will help us. Yes present this to the bishops and saying, look, we're, we really want this saint and we want him now because the church desperately needs him. We also want to help uh, reinstate some faith in the church itself because people will like, they've raised questions. Well, what about the whole process of canonization? Mm -hmm. Is the church going to be listening to the state now? Uh, is, uh, I mean, a, a state that's going to yeah. be a, not a friend or even hostile to the church and realize that they can disrupt these processes. Does the church not trust its own processes? I, I, I thought like they're the ones in control and command of this because the, the secular world can say anything it wants without out, even without any uh, evidence. Yeah. Yeah. And that can sabotage somebody. So it's like, who are we trusting in all of this? Um, and, you know, like Roche, the Diocese of Rochester could make a phone call or two and, and get the information specifically about Sheen in light of this particular event. They could get that information while they're waiting for this report that's in depth. I mean, it's just why it hasn't happened is a big mystery and it raises even more questions. I mean, Illinois just came out with theirs, I think, today. Um, and yeah. so uh, I, I don't, I don't know. So we're, it's, 
we're trying to we're trying to bring everything positive for Sheen, as well as because we know what will happen as soon as um, yeah. he's beatified. It's it's just going to be life. It's going to be transformative. I believe not just for the church in the United States, but through throughout the world. When I talk to people about him, they love Fulton Sheen. Yeah, it's it's Same incredible. Here. I'm like, wow, you're, you're you're not English isn't even your main language, <laughs> and they they ha there's not there hasn't been really a more universal saint that's appealed to people other than like John Paul II, of course. And they're very, very similar individuals uh, in what they they're in, in their mission. They're almost identical. It's like John the Baptist preparing the way for yeah. the coming yeah. of our Lord. Wow, and that's big. there wasn't room in the world for both when John Paul came. And the last thing Sheen was told before he died, um, I mean, this in the sense of like on record, you could say was two months before he died. He met Saint or John John Paul II. He was just a year a year as yes. a pope. And he's and John Paul embraced him and says, "You are a faithful son of the church. You have written and spoken well of our Lord Jesus Christ." Like, wow, what more? It's, Sheen couldn't have prayed for anything more for himself because yeah. he never really prayed for himself except for two things. You know, um, when he died, he wanted to die in front of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament and a feast day of Mary. Talk about that some other time because yeah. it happened. Wow. Second thing is, is just to know that he was faithful. That everything he did was was worth it and faithful and he got that stamp of approval from the man he predicted in his own autobiography would go down as the greatest pope in the history of the church and would be known as the great wow it's look that up <laughs> treasure and clay i forget i don't know the page but he talks yeah, about right book so yeah i think the devil doesn't want this to happen mm -hmm. that's my conclusion and i'm on the the, the lay side of the church militant and not rather than cause division we we want this to be something of unity and yeah. sheen will yeah. absolutely bring that about he will shake people he'll shake their consciences he's going to shake the clergy because he spent the last 10 years of his life after the council after bishop of rochester the last decade was all about the he didn't use the word reform but it was priest retreat after priest retreat after priest retreat because mm -hmm. he knew what the priests were up against and he watched so many leave wow. and he says the the priests of our times they have to be priests of the eucharist yeah. that's why fulton sheen is the model for the eucharist i don't know if they're calling it for it in australia but the eucharistic revival they're yeah. calling it here yeah. um that's right i mean this is the man the entire world needs to discover so i'm not giving it a plug for myself to fly me out to australia new zealand asia india places you know yeah. of course i'd go but he, but you cannot encounter Fulton Sheen without having your life changed. Yeah, I mean, you will never convince me otherwise. I've never come across a person who's who's not experienced that in some capacity. Yeah, praise God. Now, uh, just before we close here, so to the, this petition, um, what happens? People register the, a name, email, and then you will present that to the diocese. Or how does this work? Sure. Yes, you go to the go to FultonSheenMovement dot com. And you'll see, yep, your name it might only be first name, email. Um, I have country because we want to know where people are chiming in from. That's actually really important. Yes. Um, because Rome has specifically said, not just with Sheen, but they did say it with Sheen, they want to, they'd like to see a universal cult behind that saint. And so, um, anyway, so, yes. you know, our first target is to get up to 200,000 signatures. It just isn't that much when you think about it, considering how many people there are in the world and Catholics. Um, and you look at podcasters yes. who have 300,000 followers. They do. Like, we, can we not do this for Fulton Sheen? Yeah. Because then it goes to the Bishop of Rochester and also the U.S. Yes. bishops first. Because the call, the call that's going to change this is going to come from New York to Rome. Rochester says that we will abide by anything Rome tells us. But Rome is saying, but we need to make sure that there's no other things that is a problem. They don't want any problems. And Rochester is the only place that's going to say there are no more. So it really comes down to Rochester telling us what's going on. Why is there this pause? We want to you know, unpause the pause. Yes. Um, and then so they'll get presented. And then we will also present the same thing to the Congregation for Saints. So um, 
you know, there's different ways that we can do that. If we get extraordinary, I mean, I'd love to see many, many more than that, but that's like the first major phase. Um, and then they will know this is a collective voice. So it's not at the very least, it's not something that they can ignore behind the scenes and we get second and tertiary reports of things. It's the faithful one answers and we want our saint and you've already declared him ready to be declared blessed. So let's get this done. You know, otherwise it hurts the, it hurts the church when people are suspicious. Like does their process not mean anything? Like, what does that mean? Should we relook at John, St. John Paul II? I mean, talk about a man who had the entire world underneath him of bishops and cardinals. And, and there was a, those were, there was a lot of scandal of those people, nothing under Sheen. It's like, you know, you see yeah. where I'm going. It's like a really dangerous rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if that's, I don't think that's the intention, but it's from this side of things and as a theologian, and it's like, you do not want to have this adding more confusion to yeah. what's yeah. going on in the church and in the world. So anyway, we, we believe the answer is very simple and um, let's trust, trust in the church's already deter, you know, made determination on Sheen. Let's get him blessed yes. and watch the miracles, watch the transformation, watch young priests rediscover a love for their priests so that they've never had Watch the the whole church, I believe is going to rediscover the importance of the Eucharistic Holy Hour. And I, I, to the extent that God, you know, will use this movement, I pray it's in a massive way. And, uh, you know, it's, it's about Sheen and no one else in the church. Praise God. Well, God bless you for your efforts. Keep going. Don't stop. And, uh, and, um, we're, we're supporting. I've, I've signed myself and encourage anyone just to just sign up and let's get 200,000. Um, so have the Aussies do it. You alone can do this it. And God willing. <laughs> Yeah. 15 seconds. Let's she, pray. 15 seconds Let's make to make happen. history. That's Dr. Good. Scott Hahn assigned it. Jason Everett assigned it. Jason yeah. Jones assigned it. We, we were blessed to have um, you know a number of leaders. So um, I'm going to be in California on the show. Mm-hmm. I won't be there next week. We're going to be talking about this with, with the bishop. So I want to get my first bishop on board too. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we're praying. Keep going. Don't stop. And thanks for joining us today, Dr. Peter Howard. Um, uh, I hope people sign up and um, and also get to know more about your work because it's doing fantastic and hope to get you on. Um, love to talk about Academy stuff uh, mm-hmm. as well for us uh, down the track. So God bless you and let's um, looking forward to seeing you again sometime. Oh, very much uh, likewise over here. Thank you. Keep up the great work uh, down under. And yes, I hope that the Lord works really soon. You know, time is ticking. A lot to be done. So Amen. I'm at your service. Absolutely. Absolutely. God bless you all. Thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. That's uh, another Perusia podcast. I'm Shabba Resh, your host. And until next time, God bless. Bye.